Okay, first of all, a very good evening all of you. Uh, please confirm the audio and video streaming. And if you have any issues with the same, uh, do let me know in the comment section. It's been a long time, almost one month since we had our, our live session. So we'll restart our live sessions with a focus on upcoming NEET MDS, that is NEET MDS 2022. So I hope you guys are all ready for today's live session. And this live session, we'll have textbook discussion from the topic endodontic flare-ups for which we'll be referring Grossman's 13th edition, right? So I'll be sharing various important points in the process of this textbook discussion and also we'll see the kind of questions we can expect after reviewing the existing literature and I'm going to also share some very interesting up-to-date information regarding these flare-ups, right? So, I hope it's all streaming fine. Uh, please confirm the streaming before we go ahead. Okay, streaming fine. So I reckon even the audio is fine. So in any, uh, in the process of this live session, if you find any interruption or if you have any issue with the streaming, uh, do leave a comment, okay? We'll see if we can address that accordingly. So first and foremost, what are these endodontic emergencies? And when do you say that a particular situation is an emergency? And how do you address it? Do we need to give a fixed appointment, especially when dealing with an, any kind of emergency? And also, in today's live session, we'll focus on flare-ups. What, what's uh, basically a flare-up? And what are the various factors which can contribute to flare-up? And believe me when I say this, it's not a single factor. There are so many factors, complex array of factors, including a genetic role in the etiopathogenesis of uh, flare-ups and also how do we identify them and most importantly how to manage these flare-ups so that will be the focus of our today's live session so first and foremost we'll see what an emergency is so as i said i'll be referring grossman 13th edition so an endodontic emergency so it can be uh, mostly in dental scenario it's usually pain severe pain or swelling and patient comes or makes an unscheduled a visit and uh, most importantly as a dentist or as a clinician we, we should provide appropriate treatment to alleviate the patient from those particular symptoms mostly pain and swelling right uh, that's what uh, usually constitutes an emergency so an endodontic emergency is defined as pain and or swelling caused by inflammation or infection of pulp and or periradicular tissues necessitating, which requires emergency visit to the dentist for immediate treatment. So once we understand what this endodontic emergency is, so there are different types of emergencies. So endodontic emergency which can happen prior to treatment or during treatment, which is the worst case scenario for the dentist because patient remains asymptomatic but when he or she comes for treatment, once we initiate root canal, patient jumps out in pain, either during the treatment or after uh, between the appointments. And patient assumes that we cause that pain. That's why I said it's a worst case scenario. And also there can be pain after treatment, after completion of root canal. So we have a classification which is mentioned in Grossman. So before treatment, we have endodontic emergencies presenting with either pain or swelling in the form of various pulpitis or even periapical abscess, even phoenix abscess. So crack tooth syndrome, symptomatic reversible pulpitis, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, symptomatic apical periodontitis, phoenix abscess, acute allular abscess, cellulitis, all of these constitute emergencies before treatment. And also there can be traumatic injuries, fracture of tooth, fracture of crown, fracture of root. And there are emergencies during treatment. One is hot tooth, which we discussed previously. You can find that video even in YouTube. And the other is endodontic flare-up, which we'll focus now. And there can be emergencies even after treatment, which includes root fractures, vertical root fractures, or even post obturation pain. You think we, uh, we, we think we've done our treatment perfectly and once obturation is completed, patient goes home, calls us again, complaining that he or she has pain. 
So uh, th that, that's something which we don't uh, want to hear. So in such situations, when patient has an emergency, what's the kind of treatment we institute? What's the role of antibiotics? What's the role of analgesics? Which medication should we give? And, in, and also very importantly, what's the, uh, is there any uh, difference like uh, males versus females when you compare? Uh, do you think one particular sex or gender experiences pain to a greater extent than the other? So that's another interesting finding which we'll try to review at the end of this session. But before that, we have seen the classification of endodontic emergencies just now. And also, what's a flare up? So I, I, I hope you have your textbooks alongside with you. That's the reason why we posted an update along with the reference book in uh, this afternoon session. So if you don't have any book, at least uh, make note of various important points which we'll be discussing in this process of textbook discussion. So an endodontic flare, it's an acute exacerbation of an asymptomatic pulp or a periapical pathosis after initiation or continuation of root canal treatment. That's why we say that this constitutes an emergency emergency during treatment so the reported incidence of interappointment flare-ups is uh, very low but the range is uh, wider that is 1.4 to 19 percent even though these values vary from each uh, textbook so grossman says so whereas uh, this percentage incidence varies uh, with the information given in engel or even cohen so let's stick to the information given in grossman so the incidence the reported incidence of interappointment flare-ups Interappointment flare-ups form a true emergency that requires an unscheduled patient visit and immediate active treatment for pain relief. So symptomatic uh, relief of pain is very much important. So let's look into the combination of drugs a bit later. So what are various predisposing factors? As I said, it's not a single entity or a single factor which is responsible for flare-up. In fact, there are a wide range of complex factors, including genetics, which play a role in uh, these uh, flare-ups. So first and foremost, you, you can see uh, they've provided a table uh, with a list of various factors, significant factors and other factors. As you can see, page number 150. So significant factors include shaping related errors, cleaning errors, pulpo-periapical status and treatment cases. We need not uh, re remember or mug up all these things, but let's try to understand and see their clinical uh, correlation. So shaping errors include over instrumentation, under instrumentation or incomplete instrumentation, improper shaping technique, all of this, which uh, can potentially lead to, you know, uh, sending the material. Uh, necrotic debris or microbes out of the apex or even under instrumentation which can promote growth of more virulent forms of microbes thus uh, leading to these flare-ups and also cleaning errors irrigation extrusion hypochlorite accident which we have seen in the form of case reports also we'll go through that now including uh, the management part which is very very uh, important and essential to save a patient's life pulpoperapical status retreatment cases so these are some of the factors which are considered to be a major or significant factors contributing to endodontic flare-ups and then we have other factors like anxiety the pre-operative history of pain in fact anxiety if patient is anticipating pain he or she will experience pain which is very interesting oh, it seems hypothetical but it's completely true when you anticipate something uh, it's bound to happen more or less so first and foremost shaping errors so we'll see what's this over instrumentation when you try to you know go beyond the apex when during your chemo mechanical preparation when you're not confining the instrument within the root canal and you by accident or by intention to achieve patency of opening uh, you just go beyond the canal and there is a greater chance that you're pushing the debris microbes dentinal shavings and all beyond the apex thereby creating an inflammatory response in the periapical area which can lead to flare up so this iatrogenic error or instrumentation results in forcing debris into the periradicular region resulting in an acute inflammatory response and pain is one of the uh, components of inflammation isn't it 
and incomplete or under instrumentation is another shaping error which can contribute to flare-ups. So this may provide pulpal remnants for persistence of microorganisms and in fact you know under instrumentation or inadequate preparation can shift the microbial uh, focus towards more resistant forms thereby promoting or causing flare-ups. And then shaping technique. So again, under instrumentation, improper shaping technique, they all implicate the same. So we're not, we're not trying to eliminate microbes as much as possible uh, to the best of our ability, leading to these flares. And when we talk about shaping technique, I mean, uh, they mentioned a comparison between step down and step back and crown down. So among these two techniques, which is more prone for, you know, flare-ups. So this is a clinical based approach or question which you can expect. So a step back shaping technique where you repeatedly enter into the, you know, the terminal portion of the root canal, there is a greater chance for us to extrude the material beyond the apex. If you remember what step back technique is, so step back shaping technique has a greater tendency to extrude debris into the periradicular region than crown down technique. So in crown down technique, as you move from coronal towards the apical portion, you're trying to remove the bulk of uh, the necrotic material, including the infected dentin. So the chance of extruding material, you know, bad material beyond the apex, necrotic material and all beyond the apex is minimal. And that's one of the advantages of crown down technique, right? So do make a note of this point. And then moving to the next major factor, cleaning errors. What if there is inadvertent extrusion of irrigating solution beyond the apex, hypochlorite accident? You might have heard uh, about uh, one or uh, some of your seniors doing it or you might have seen your batchmates by mistake pumping hypochlorite into soft tissues. So there is, that's a possibility. In fact, during our UG, uh, I've seen uh, one of them. I heard and I've seen one of them injecting. A hypochlorite, assuming that it was LA since it, uh, since it was loaded in a LA bottle. So accidents do happen, but we should be uh, very cautious and prevention is the best mode of uh, approach, isn't it? But what if there is inadvertent extrusion of material or uh, solution into soft tissues? How do you manage it? So let's look into that now. So irrigation or irrigant extrusion, the standard regimen of irrigation used routinely is 0.1 to 5.2 percent of hypochlorite with 17 percent EDTA. In endodontics, every procedure including irrigation of pulp space is passive in nature. Inadvertent extrusion of irrigant beyond the pair apex, a termed sodium hypochlorite accident, may be one of the causes of endodontic flare-up. Right? So, now uh, what are the various signs of hypochlorite accident? Uh, before we go ahead with that, let me show you a clinical image, a uh, few of the case reports which are available in articles. Yeah, you can just check it out. Yeah, you can see, you can see once uh, the hypochlorite enters into soft tissues, the range of clinical manifestations which are evident. Complete swelling, ballooning of soft tissues as described in literature. Uh, which you can clearly appreciate in this particular uh, uh, case. Ballooning of soft tissues. There can be pain, a necrosis of soft tissues, isn't it? So what are the signs of hypochlorite accident? Let's look into them now. So the patient complains of severe and excruciating pain, especially when he or she is not under local anesthesia. Even though if they are under local anesthesia, they complain of irritation of tissues. There is sudden flooding of canal with blood and tissue fluids. There may be ballooning of tissues in the area and swelling of soft tissues. As sodium hypochlorite is hypertonic, it leads, once it enters into periradicular tissues, it leads to opening up of capillaries and minute blood vessels. Flooding of the canal with blood happens, which is a physiological reaction to dilute the concentration of sodium hypochlorite. So how do you manage? The patient has to be informed about the accident, the first and foremost thing, informing the patient. And if the patient is not given a local anesthesia, then go ahead with block anesthesia, right, depending upon the area. And bleeding from the canal is continuously allowed to flow since this is a defense 
physiological mechanism and the canal is flooded with normal saline so that the accumulated blood comes out and the level of pain uh, decreases because we are trying to relieve the pressure and sodium hypochlorite can dissolve both normal and infected tissue. Post sodium hypochlorite accident, the periarticular area remains inflamed and the tissues are necrosed as you have seen some of the images. It is preferred that the patient is immediately placed on parenteral antibiotic therapy including analgesics. Call the patient for a follow up periodically to assess the rate of healing. In the event of an uncontrolled flare-up, you can even refer to a general surgeon or a physician for expert opinion and administering steroids in a planned or phased manner. The patient may require backup vitamin therapy during the recovery phase. And it's very important that the kind of or the technique of irrigation which we perform plays a major role. You might have heard of a side vent needles. So as you can see, this is a side vent needle with different sizes, 30 gears, uh, 20 gears. So we have different size, sizes of side vent needles, which should be employed, especially when you're going ahead with uh, root canal or intra canal irrigation. So always using passive irrigation, not forcing, not engaging the needle within the canal and forcing uh, the irrigant beyond the apex. Sodium hypochlorite should be handled carefully. Even when you are using rubber dam, there can be seepage beneath rubber dam, which can lead to various unwanted effects like ulcers, gingival pain, etc. The recommended anodontic irrigation needle is 30 gauge side vent needle. This is something which I wanted to make a note of or underline if you have you know, textbooks with you. The recommended endodontic irrigation needle is 30 gauge side vented close ended needle placed passively. 3 mm short of working length in case of posterior T, 1 mm short of working length in case of anterior T. So this is the criteria we have, uh, consider this very very important. Okay, And in case of immature teeth with uh, open epices, care should be exercised to ensure that the irrigant is not extruded beyond the periodical area because of blunderbuss canals wide open apex. And to avoid flushing of the canal beyond, do not engage the needle into the dentin. Rather, it has to be passively moving inside the canal. And also, you might have heard of endovac, which is based on a negative pressure technique. You can refer a Grossman for more information and consider this very, very important. And coming to the next aspect, pulpo-periapetal status. Studies have indicated that teeth with vital pulps result in fewer flare-ups compared with those with necrotic pulps, maybe because of microbial content and all. So similarly, teeth with acute alveolar abscess have a higher incidence of flare-ups. And retreatment cases, since you are going ahead with retreatment, there can be a possibility of extruding material beyond apex. So thereby increasing the incidence of flare-ups, especially in retreatment cases. And there are other factors like anxiety, preoperative history of pain. And it's very interesting to see that if a patient expects pain to occur during endodontic treatment, there is increased likelihood that an increased amount of pain will be perceived following completion of subsequent treatment as we just discussed in the beginning. And you can see the mechanism of flare-up which is mentioned in Grossman, they are calling something as local adaptation syndrome just because there is infection inside the tooth. Yeah, you can't see the image properly, don't worry, we will share that uh, in the form of a link or we will uh, do something to share that image, okay? Yeah, don't worry. So, First and foremost thing is, uh, whenever there is any infection in the canal, uh, it doesn't mean that you know uh, there will be pain or there will be progression of lesion or there will be progression of infection. There is something called as local adaptation syndrome where the inflammatory part and the microbial aspect, they come to kind of uh, homeostasis, uh, maybe you can say, which, uh, which, which leads to a symptomatic phase of the disease. So local adaptation response, which is a symptomatic phase where disease persists without progressing. And once you initiate root canal treatment, you are disturbing that homogeneity that is existing between these two factors, inflammatory, that is host factors and microbial factors, leading to acute exaggerated pain, which is, we are terming it as flare-ups. So this leads to severe inflammatory response, leading to endodontic flare-ups during treatment. And management of endodontic flare-ups, it's given in a very brief manner here in Grossman, but in Ingel, it's given very extensively.
But to give you an overview, anxiety reduction, behavioral intervention, occlusal reduction, pharmacological measures, antibiotics, NSAIDs, long acting local anesthesia. So these are some of the considerations or aspects which we should keep in mind when it comes to management part. And we'll try to extend the same. And I've highlighted, uh, in fact, I've picked some important points in regard to management part of flare-ups from Ingel 7th edition. And I'll be reviewing some information now. First and foremost thing is occlusal reduction. So if you go ahead with occlusal reduction, even before initiating root canal treatment or during, any, during root canal treatment, uh, do you think the incidence of flare-ups might reduce? Because once you reduce the occlusion, right, once you relieve the occlusion, there won't be much forces acting along the periodontal area. So uh, do you think this occlusal reduction would reduce the incidence of flare-ups? Engel says, research says, yes, it does. So occlusal reduction prevents post-operative pain when any or all of the following indicators are present in a patient who turns up for root canal treatment, including sensitivity to percussion. So before initiating root canal treatment, if the patient has sensitivity to percussion, if the tooth is vital, if there is history of pain, or if there is absence of periapical radiographic lesion, right? So in such cases, if you go ahead with occlusal reduction, it reduces post-operative pain or uh, flare-ups, incidence of flare-ups. So occlusal reduction prevents post-operative pain when any or all of the indicators were present as we have just gone through. So consider this very, very important. And what about role of genetics? So this is a very interesting information. In fact, it's very interesting and exciting. And there is a still a lot of study that needs to be done to understand the role of genetics. Like, can we say, because of genetic composition, a particular individual is more susceptible to flare-ups or uh, might experience flare-ups to a greater extent than the other person with a gen different genetic makeup. Yes, so specific markers uh, associated with pro-inflammatory regulators IL-1B, which is a key regulator of host response, may contribute to increased susceptibility to periapical pathosis. So even genetics do play a key role and uh, might uh, influence you know uh, the patient's experience of flare-ups okay so uh, in fact we'll have mcqs discussion from this particular topic in our next live session and uh, you'll be getting all the literature in the form of mcqs and in the form of explanations don't worry even if you're missing out anything but i'm sure you're making a note of various important points including the role of il1b now uh, male versus female so which sex do you think experiences more pain so uh, in fact there are several studies on that and it's interesting uh, to know that it's females who experience more pain uh, women are at a substantially greater risk for many clinical pain conditions owing to hormonal changes different composition all, all, all together so uh, various factors uh, are responsible for this but the end result of the conclusion of those studies is that women are at substantially greater risk for many clinical pain conditions. Yeah. And then uh, finally, medication. So this is something which we are all uh, very interested in. This is very important because ultimately, when you treat a patient, uh, along with uh, you know organic treatment of root canals, restorations and all, we also provide medication. So should we give antibiotics? Should we give analgesics? So let's look into that now. First and foremost, if you look into antibiotics, an evidence-based review determined that use of systemic antibiotics for prevention of post-treatment endodontic pain should be discouraged. In fact, we have uh, extensively discussed about antibiotics in dentistry previously in uh, n number of occasions. Antibiotics are not required in most of the situations. Especially in healthy patients with localized endodontic infections, antibiotics are not required at all. But unfortunately, they are being you know, prescribed rampantly without any scientific basis. And even WHO recommends against the use, indiscriminate use of antibiotics. So first and foremost, the conclusion of uh, several studies point out that an evidence-based review determined that use of systemic antibiotics for prevention of post-treatment endodontic pain should be discouraged. 
So in healthy individuals with localized endodontic infection, antibiotics are not necessary. Then when do we give antibiotics? Maybe if the patient is medically compromised or maybe if in a healthy patient that localized pain is trying to enter into systemic areas uh, which you can appreciate in the form of various signs and symptoms, fever, malaise, uh, swelling, you know, a weakness. So if there is systemic uh, indication that this infection is spreading, of course, yes, you can go ahead with antibiotics prescription. Now, coming to painkillers, so which painkillers should we give? How many painkillers should we give? Should we ask the patient to take painkillers as per the clock or as per the wish whenever they have pain? And if the patient is coming for root canal treatment, should he or she take an analgesic just before or after treatment? So we have guidelines for the same. So first and foremost, various studies have uh, used a different criteria and come up with the following conclusions according to Engel. One or two tablets of a single tablet combination of ibuprofen and estominophen, that is ibuprofen paracetamol combination, one or two drugs, this, this combination is very much effective than two tablets of estominophen or codeine or one tablet of ibuprofen estominophen combination. So the point is two tablets, one or two tablets of a single tablet combination of ibuprofen and estominophen. Ibuprofen 200 milligrams, estominophen 500 milligrams is found to be more effective in relieving pain. And next, should, uh, should the patient take analgesic as per the clock or as needed basis? Like whenever they have pain, should they take uh, the painkiller or should they take a painkiller as per the clock, like every six hours or every eight hours? It is suggested that endodontic patients take their analgesics by the clock rather than as needed basis, which ensures optimum level of medication in their blood, thereby addressing their pain accordingly, right? So as by the clock is very important. So they have to take it like, you know, every six hours or every eight hours, depending upon the medication. And finally, should the patient take medication before treatment or after treatment because you know there are certain predisposing factors if as we have seen previously if there is sensitivity to percussion if there is a vital tooth history of pain absence of periapical radiographic lesion so if you suspect that this particular case or situation needs analgesic when do you ask the patient to take it so patient should take medication just prior to or immediately after treatment if indicated and you know, interestingly, if, pa if, if patient doesn't take medication uh, before or after treatment immediately, if, pa if you ask patient to take medication when they have pain, then you know what, they'll, have, they'll experience more pain because the moment a patient takes medication, it takes around one hour, approximately one hour for the effect, uh, for the pain reduction to happen. So I have pain now. I take a medication, so I have to experience pain for at least one hour or so. Depends, uh, there can be again subjective variation. So it's better to take medication, especially painkiller, one hour before the procedure or immediately after the treatment. In cases where it is, or where you suspect uh, that this case might turn up into a flare up, right? So these are certain specific indications. So this extensive literature review regarding flare-ups will convert this in the form of MCQ's discretion in another live session, right? So, see, once you go through standard literature, you have nothing to worry about. You'll have no confusion whatsoever. And, you know, the fun part is you'll uh, come across uh, very, very important information, which is very interesting because uh, uh, you'll be uh, getting, you'll be coming across several studies which do uh, which consider a wide range of factors and uh, they come at an appropriate conclusion which helps us to a greater extent in our clinical practice especially flare-ups because these are something which we experience as clinicians on almost day-to-day -day basis root canals are most commonly performed nowadays so uh, understanding flare-ups the mechanism of flare up the factors responsible for these flare-ups and managing this will enhance not just our academic, uh, uh, you know, academic knowledge or academic career, but also our clinical practice, right? So with this objective, we have taken this up as our first topic of a live session, a textbook discussion. 
and we'll try to incorporate more of these textbook discussions from other subjects as well okay and if we plan any live session we'll let you know at least a couple of hours prior like uh, today we had live session at 7 30 so we informed you by 1 pm so by noon you will be giving you an update if there is a live session in that particular day so you can just keep a tab on our youtube channel for updates or you can join our telegram updates group which is for free to everyone right so you have any queries you need any assistance you can always uh, feel free to get back through mail at proud to be dentist at gmail.com 24 by 7 and also uh, we, in the next live session we'll have exclusive mcqs case based discussions image based discussions from this very topic of anodontic flare-ups for which we'll be referring grossman cohen and engel i'm giving you a heads up and once we plan that live session as i said we'll inform you a uh, few hours prior and on the on the very same day okay so i hope uh, the session is uh, informative and uh, any live session any discussion which you come across make this habit of maintaining notes which is going to help you uh, especially during your revision phase another three to four months before the final exam so just focus on giving your best no matter what the situations or challenges are right so wish you all the best love you all and i'll see you again in another live session very soon yeah hi hi rishikesh vasuki hi hi palavi felicio rister nidhi saumya uh, Monica, Pooja, very good evening to all of you. Uh, Felice, you can't see image properly. Yes, uh, we'll see if we can share that uh, in one format or the other. We'll just think about it and uh, we'll update that in uh, this particular video accordingly. Vasukiya, sir, should we refer Ingil or Kohen? I would suggest uh, a combination. All right, uh, see, for this particular live session, I personally refer to Grossman, which is my primary reference. Ingil, and Cohen. In fact, there is extensive information available even in Engel. I would suggest if you have time, if you are in final year, if you are in third year, yes, go ahead, refer these three standard textbooks for uh, endodontics. Okay. Hi, Rashmi. Oh, very good evening. Hi, Tanya. Procedural errors, definitely. We will plan one textbook discussion on procedural errors as well. Sure. You're welcome, Smith. Okay, guys, so have a happy weekend and take care. Good night.